Great. Uh, thanks for taking the time to come out this afternoon. I know it's, uh, it's kind of a nice sunny day out there. You could be doing other things. But we're here uh, in a leadership conference forum, so we want to press into everything that God has for us. Amen? Let's uh, start off by prayer. Now that my buddy's here. <laughs> thank you, Father, for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that we have this amazing relationship with the God who created the universe and uh, we get to be friends with you and all the different aspects of who you are. Um, you call us to expect out of that relationship communication. You want to direct your church, you're a God who speaks and uh, the airwaves are filled with your, it's not like we've got to press you to try and speak to us. You want to speak, it's just us tuning in like a radio. Uh, we need to tune in. So I pray uh, this afternoon, Lord, that we would somehow in this workshop, I want to stir us up. I pray you would stir us up, Lord, to a clearer, more precise hearing from you and being directed by you. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. That's what it's about this afternoon. It says in uh, Acts 27, verse 9 uh, to 14, much time had been lost and sailing had become already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast, so Paul warned them. Acts 27, verse 10, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest when a gentle south wind began to blow. If you've got your Bible open, that's a good thing to underline uh, there because that line there uh, kind of frames the way a lot of people are led. Uh, here you've got Paul being uh, tuned into the Lord, God speaking and saying, hey, here's what's going to happen. And, uh, of course, it's understandable that the captain of the ship would say, well, who are you? Just Paul, you know. Um, but he was working according to what a lot of us work according to, and at a circumstance, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before it, very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. And you know the rest of the story. They end up shipwrecking. It's just such a good picture there of this contrast of hearing from God and being led by circumstances. Because in this stage of following the Lord, some 40 some years, uh, I have found over and over again in leadership, people making decisions, major decisions. Uh, I think all of our decisions may need to be made in the Lord, but the Lord expects us. He's revealed in his word, his will for us, and he does expect us to get on life. I'm not somebody who thinks that every step you've got to hear from God, no turn left, you know. You can have seasons of that or times of that where God wants to direct you specifically. But the fact is that the Lord wants to lead us. And we need to be making major, major decisions in our lives. Need to be submitted to the Lord because at the end of the day, hello, He's the Lord. And He said that we're supposed to pray this daily, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in my life today. So that's not just idle words saying, God, hey, you be Lord, you direct me, and then I just carry on with my life. I really am convinced that God wants to speak to us. I've called this hearing God's voice, and I did that on purpose because people are kind of anxious about the idea of hearing God speak, you know. Uh, hearing his voice, you need to understand there's a whole bunch of the church out there that thinks that's pretty spooky. But i chose it because it's biblical. Jesus said that. Jesus said in John 10, where's my scripture? John 10 verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So my question for you, this is a workshop. We want a little bit of interaction here. My question for you is how are you going to follow the Lord according to that scripture? Anybody want to shout it out? According to John 10, 27, how are you supposed to follow the Lord? Hmm? John 10, 27. 
Sorry, I didn't hear. To listen. to listen, right. The way we're going to follow him is to listen to his voice. And who gets to listen to his voice according to that scripture? The sheep. The sheep. Everybody say, bah, you know. No, no. <laughs> we're all sheep. So I think sometimes we think, well, this is some special commando group or it's the leadership, you know, the apostolic team needs to be hearing from God or the elders, but hey, I'll just get on with my life. No, Jesus expects us as sheep. He knows us. He has a relationship with us. And he expects us to follow him. And to follow him, we need to hear his voice. So what I'd like to do uh, with us this afternoon is try and stir you up in the area. We're going to talk about some different ways of hearing from God. But I think I'm, uh, what I'm hoping for in it is just to stir you up to expect to hear from God. Trust me, God wants to speak to you. He desires to speak to you. He desires you to follow him. You need to be hearing from God rather than making major decisions and directions in your life. I don't know how many people have said to me over the years, you know, we're going to get up and we're going to move or we're going to get into this ministry. I said, hey, well, talk to me. How's God? What's God been saying to you? No, we always wanted to go there. You know? <laughs> I shared the testimony of how God took us to Africa and he had some specific directions and so a couple got all excited about that in the service where I shared it. And then I ran into them. We ran into them like a month later. And they said, hey, we're doing what you said we should do. I said, what did I say we should do? <laughs> so well, we're going off to Scotland and we're going to be missionaries there. I said, that's great. Wow, that's good. You remember the word? Kind of talk to me. What kind of things does God be saying to you? They said, well, we always wanted to go to Scotland. <laughs> I said, you kind of miss the message that I had there then, if you think that's what I was saying. And that's all they had. They didn't have anything else from God, except they always wanted to go there. So, hey, God wants us to go out to the nations. Scotland's a place we've always wanted to go. Why not? And over the years in pastoring, I've seen lots of people make lots of decisions. Many disastrous decisions just based on we think it'd be a good idea. Well, it's great that you think it's a good idea, but I really believe God wants to speak specifically. I got saved hearing God's voice. I didn't believe in him. I, didn't, I was doing everything that was contrary to the things that pleased the Lord, doing my own thing on a beach in Australia in 1974. God spoke to me, and I knew it was God, and he revealed himself to me. And so I kind of had a heads up in this thing, and then I got saved hearing from him. But what it's done is, is that it's made me not settle for anything less. This is the God I have relationship. How many know that good communication is at the basis of any relationship? You know? We expect that. And uh, so we should expect it with God. So what I'd like to ask you is this question. How does God speak to you? What are some ways that we could talk about today? On I can just dole them out to you here, but... It is two something in the afternoon here, so we want to get you a little live here. So uh, think about it. We're going to put them up here. What, what are some ways God speaks to us? The words. Let's put that one up there, bro. The word. That's good. That's number one, right? Everything has to work out of God's word. What's another one? Through Sorry? Through. Through other people? Good. Other people can have a word for you? Great. Prayer, good. God speaks in prayer. Keep praying about something. God just keeps putting a burden on you for something. And uh, that's one of the ways he speaks to us. Yeah, yeah. Sorry? Oh, did somebody say still small voice? No, oh, I never heard that. They're hearing you back there. We're not hearing you up here. Shout it out. Anything else? Through dreams, good. Hmm? As we're saying something? Yeah, that's that would be under still small voice, I would think, you know. Yeah. He speaks audibly sometimes, yeah. Some people are not comfortable with that. Tyron says he hasn't heard God speak audibly to him, but I used to teach this as a class in a Bible school in Africa, and I would ask every year uh, this very thing I'm asking you, and I would say, how many here has ever heard the audible voice of God? And uh, not every year, but 
different, interesting to hear uh, people. One, one of the guys I remember uh, was a pastor up in the, uh, he was an evangelist, and he was up in the mountains in Lesotho. And uh, he heard an audible voice. He said, I was just walking across the field, cut off from any other communication around there, very remote, and I heard an audible voice speak to me that said, Nicholas Bengo is dead. That was it. But he had been really groomed by Nicholas Bengo. He's, if you're from South Africa, he's a famous evangelist. And uh, he would have wanted to be at that funeral, so he realized, hey, God's given me a heads up. And if he hadn't heard that voice, he would never have got to the funeral. That would have been a sad thing for him. So God can do that. How else does God speak to us? Circumstances, very good. I'm talking about positive circumstances here. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is that can't be the only thing that leads you. But it is one of the things. The door has to open, you know. No circumstances. Mental, mental picture, is that good. Dreams and visions. We'll put it under visions, okay? Yeah. Good. How are we doing? Come on, there's more. There's some obvious ones you're missing here, I think. Sorry? Yeah, I'd put that under circumstance. Hardship. Ah, that is an interesting one. Yeah, God can speak into that. I think what God can do in hardship, though, is, is that he can use it to press you in to want to hear, okay, what's this about, you know? Um, I would think more than, yeah, I guess he could give you direction that way. What about Prophecy. That's one, eh? A lot of people are very dependent on prophecy. But again, you can't be dependent on any of these things. You've got to have a personal relationship with the Lord where you're hearing. Words of knowledge, words of knowledge. good. I kind of lump all that under the prophetic, but it, yeah, words of knowledge. Any more? How are we doing? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There must be some more. Hmm? Is that the word? Yeah, that's the word, really. Yeah, you're right. Anointing comes on the word. You just know it's for you. It's good. How about the peace of God? A lot of people led by the peace of God. They just sense the peace or not, you know. That's uh, another one. Anything more? Have we got it all? Have we done the whole works? All right, that's pretty good. I think I've got a couple extras. Check. Oh, yeah, that's more under visions. Yeah. Got a friend of ours that prophesies, and when she prophesies, she said she reads it just like a ticker tape. It's just, <laughs> I said, lay hands on me. I want that gift, you know. <laughs> So you don't have to wonder whether you got the right words. It's just your reading. <laughs> she says it's sometimes just like a newspaper. A newspaper just comes up in front of her and she just re takes a mic and just reads. You know? I want that gift. I don't have it. <laughs> All right, let me give you a few of these. You want to take some notes uh, over some of the ones we've talked about. Of course, the word, uh, Psalm 119, verse 105, says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So God is not going to speak to us outside of his word. He's given a major revelation to us of how he wants us to live. As we've heard already today, uh, it's not God saying something to us that's contrary to his word. Well, sometimes people come and they want to bounce something off you. I feel God is saying, I said, it's not God. He's, it's just not in his word. You, know? so you can't just take the letter of the word. You've got to take the heart of the word, right? The old classic one, a uh, guy flips the Bible open, he wants direction, flips it open, and it says, Judas hung himself. <laughs> Whoa, you know, put that down. So he flips it over again, and the scriptures go and do likewise. You know, so it's not really the heart. You can find a scripture for anything you want to do, in other words. Um, but we're talking about the heart of God. Uh, so words, the bottom line. But God does use words. He also uses words where he just... Highlights words to us. You're just reading through the Bible and suddenly that scripture just comes alive to you. I had uh, this experience when we were going to Africa. God had been speaking to us over a year. We were seeking direction. We came to a major decision we had to make around employment. Are we going to go to Africa or do I take this job? 
kind of a thing. Uh, we're finishing Bible school. Okay, so where do we go? And, uh, and I just went into my prayer closet as it was my habit to do. And God said to me, almost in an audible voice, um, look up Jeremiah 28, 16. So I looked up this verse and it says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to remove you from the face of the earth. This very year you're going to die because you've preached rebellion against the Lord. In the seventh month of the year, Hananiah the prophet dies. So I closed it up real quick. <laughs> that can be God. I'm hearing voices. <laughs> and then I felt the Lord say, no, no, open it up again. I want to speak to you. And I looked down and then these, these uh, words came off of the page and everything else faded out. And the words were, therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to remove you this very year in the seventh month of that same year. So this was 1985. It was May. And we didn't have a clue where we were going. But between May and July, which is the seventh month, everything just came together and God released us to go. So look for his words. Uh, my second one is around the audible voice, the, still, the small voice. Great scripture for that. First uh, Kings 19.11 says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. This is Elijah. So it says there, the Lord said. It doesn't really tell us how he spoke. And I mean, for a lot of people who think that we don't need to hear from God, if you take not hearing from God out of the Word, you haven't got much of the Word left, you know. There's this Old Testament and New Testament. is just a lot of God's servants hearing specific direction from God. And, uh, and acting accordingly. And so we have the word. The great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. There's our, as some versions say, a still small voice. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here? Elijah. So there's two things in one scripture. One, God speaking, we're not quite sure how. Second one, a still small voice he hears. He expects in the earthquake, in the storm, in the fire, we kind of expect God to speak in a, you know, this awesome, creative, all-powerful God. But uh, God shows himself to Elijah as a still small voice that he hears. And then it says, a voice spoke to him. So you kind of have these two things happening in this one section here of an audible voice and a still small voice. And I think God uses both of those. Uh, as Tyron was saying, you know, an audible voice is not normal. It does happen. God really wants to get our attention. But a still small voice is how we normally hear. I'm, I'm putting kind of thoughts that come to us, but you have to uh, just keep testing and trying out that still small voice. And that's how you learn to discern which is the voice of God. You've got these three sources, right? You've got God wanting to speak. You've got your own flesh wanting to speak. And how many found that flesh can speak really loud, you know? <laughs> so it's hard to hear. And then, of course, the enemy wants to speak. And we have to learn to discern God's voice in all of that. Uh, and we can do that. It's worth doing. We want to follow him. So I want to encourage you. This is, I have found in talking to most people and teaching this over the years, this is the major way that God speaks. It's just that still small voice. You just know it's God speaking. There's something about his spirit behind it, speaking to your spirit. Third one is visions and dreams. Put those both in the same category. Acts 2.17 says, In the last day, God said, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. So God says that's how he's going to speak to us. Through dreams and visions. So we need to kind of uh, be looking for that. I found this interesting thing about uh, visions. I mean, there are times when it's like a dream. You have a dream and you just sense, hey, this is from God, you know, there's something about it. You remember it in the morning, uh, uh, and you have a feeling this is really from the Lord. And uh, here's how I found that you can tell whether a dream or a vision from the Lord is that it should come with an interpretation. You know? I mean, sometimes people have such complicated dreams, you know, and they say, here, you know, <laughs> what's God saying? I said, I haven't got a clue what he's saying. That thing is so complicated. 
I've found over the years that uh, most people are more complicated than I am. Uh, I mean, there, it's not, I'm trying, not trying to say because it's complicated, it's not God. But if God spoke to me that complicated, I would just say, well, too much pizza, you know. I mean, uh, I wouldn't take that as a, a dream from God. But I, I found this thing about dreams. If I sense there's something of God in it, and I say, well, God, show me what it is. And it just starts, God starts using, he used that to get my attention. And now he begins to fill in the blanks. And the same with a vision. A vision is a dream during the day while you're awake, right? A dream is while you're, a vision while you're asleep. They're very similar. Uh, sometimes you can have a dream and sometimes uh, you can see a vision and boy, it's like watching TV or so the whole thing is unfolding, you know. And, uh, but I found that um, visions, most of the time for myself, are just quick little things. I'm just worshiping the Lord or I'm, talking to somebody there's a quick little picture and in the past I would miss it I think I just dismiss it but because I'm wanting to hear more clearly I'm saying God make me more sensitive I found those things come more often little picture and it just you share it with somebody you're talking to somebody say hey, I just saw this thing about you you know while we were talking boom you know it just begins to unfold what it's all about so I'm trying to stir you up today in a short one-hour session here, and I really would like to encourage you just around the area of watching for pictures. I think sometimes people hear dreams or visions, they think, oh, well, that's somebody else, you know, that, that can never happen to me. No, it can happen to you if you're open to it, if you're willing. If you're willing to dial in the tuner on your radio, uh, you can pick up their voices right now going through this room and pictures. Uh, just in the natural, if you have the right tuner, you can hear them. And so it is with the Spirit. Be open to those things. I adjure you. We need you to hear. Fourth one is prophecy in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verse 20 and 21. It says, don't treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything, hold on to the good. That's a good exhortation when it comes to prophecy, isn't it? Don't treat it with contempt. In other words, hey, this is the way I speak. You need to be open to this. But hey, you need to test this. Is this really of God? Is the way it's being interpreted? Because prophecy is somebody speaking, whether it's a word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, or actual prophecy. It's somebody giving you a word, and many times they're kind of get inspired in the moment. I don't believe every word that everybody gives is directly from heaven. But the testing of it comes in what has God been saying to you, especially if it's a major direction. I think Agabus is a real good example of that. Uh, where was he? In Acts 21, verse 10, he comes, wraps his belt around Paul, you remember, and says, uh, so the, what does he say? The Germans are going to, or not the Germans, <laughs> the Romans. <laughs> no, the Jews are going to hand you over the, to the Romans, to the Germans, no, to the Romans. Some of them might have been German. But, uh, uh, Actually, you know, Agabus got it wrong, you know. It, it wasn't actually true. It was ended up being, you know, he's on the right track. It's such a good example for us. Um, but it actually was what the Romans had handed him over to the Jews. No, the Jews had handed him over to the Romans. That's what happened. So it was backwards to what he said. But here you got this high-profile guy coming and prophesying over you. It'd be very easy to take it all as gospel, wouldn't it? You'd, you're awed by the fact this guy is speaking to you. But... Paul says, hey, just relax. I mean, Agabus' interpretation of, was, of that was obvious. Don't go to Jerusalem. <laughs> and Paul said, hey, lots of people have been telling me that. It's just a confirmation, in other words, of what God's already been saying to me, that God has said, I'm supposed to be bound and go to Rome. Thank you for the confirmation. Now, if Paul wasn't socked into the Lord, he could have been led astray by a prophecy. He would have missed the boat. But because he was tuned in and he wasn't taking prophecy, many people run after prophecy. This guy prophesied me. I'm, I'm supposed to sell everything and go to Japan now. I said, no, don't go. Put that thing on the shelf. Ask God for some confirmation of that thing. Maybe it is God wants you to go somewhere. But it's not necessarily that that word is directly from heaven. Prophecies need to be mixed in. You're the one who needs to hear from God, in other words. If you do not want to be led by prophets, and I'm not trying to take away from prophecy. Prophecy is one of those windows from heaven where God speaks and releases um, uh, heaven on earth, according to 1 Corinthians 14. It's good. We need prophecy. 
but uh, don't let prophets lead you be led by the Holy Spirit. Fifth one is a witness of the Holy Spirit. I don't know whether that's one we got. I don't think we got that. Um, but I'll encourage you with that. There can be either a check from the Holy Spirit. We see that in Scripture. Acts 16, Paul and the guys are going out in zeal for this, this calling that they have to go to the nations. And they're trying to go here, and it says the Holy Spirit checked them. You know. They went to go over here, and the Holy Spirit resisted them. And then, you know, Paul has his dream, the Macedonian call. Uh, but it's a, it's a picture of how the Holy Spirit, sometimes you go to say something, and you just feel a check of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I like to say every time I've felt the check of the Holy Spirit, I've stopped speaking, but I haven't. I'm so inspired with my own voice, I go and stick my foot in it again. If I was obedient to the Lord, I wouldn't have done that. Or you say you're, you're, looking, you're seeking a direction, but you feel a check of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to listen to those. I had a friend in Africa who was just going to the bank. He went to the bank in Harare, and uh, as he walked up the steps of the bank, it's like he hit a force field. <laughs> I've had checks of the Holy Spirit, but I've never had that before. But he, it bounced, actually bounced him right back, he thought. Man, they're getting sophisticated here in Africa, you know. With their so he went up again and hit the thing again and knocked him back. And then he thought, okay, this sounds like the Holy Spirit. What's going on? And he looked over, and there was a guy standing there. Ended up talking to him. I can't remember the story, but it was an amazing, amazing God story that came out of that. So one of the ways is being checked by the Holy Spirit. The other way is conversely being released by the Holy Spirit. You're speaking to somebody, and the anointing comes on you. I think it's one of the, one of the major ways that God speaks. And uh, it's just one line in that conversation, and you just feel the anointing come down on that, lift off. It's like God saying, hey... That guy's speaking for me. So we need to be open to those releases of the Holy Spirit. Not just the checks of the Holy Spirit, but releases of the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to look for that. The more you press into the presence of the Lord, I'm a, I'm a Holy Spirit junkie. I just want to be full of Holy Spirit all the time. Because I find the more that I'm full of Him, the more sensitive I am to some of these things we're talking about. And if we want to see the God stories, we want to see the power of God released, scripturally we need to be hearing from God. So we want to be very sensitive, more sensitive to him. I think under the release of the Holy Spirit, Luke 1.41 is a good example. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, speaking of Jesus. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, speaking of John the Baptist. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's Jesus speaking from the womb, through two wombs. <laughs> Jesus is releasing his anointing already before he comes to the earth. It's a lovely picture. But uh, out of that, there's this prophecy that, um, that Elizabeth begins to give. So I I'll encourage you with those to watch for those things. When you feel just the anointing coming down, uh, there is a reason for it. Uh, many it's times it's God saying, don't do that or don't say that. But uh, more times than not, it's like God asterixing and saying, hey, I'm in this. Go for it. Desire. I think a lot of people, as I started off, uh, make decisions based on their desires and just always wanted to do that thing. There's only one problem with that is, is we've got a lot of desires in this thing called flesh, you know. And so you really are going to be led astray if you always just do what you would like to do. But on the other hand, if God's asking you to do something, especially if it's something you don't want to do, then he needs to give you a desire to do that thing. I had no desire to go to Africa. I, I just was nonplussed about God saying, I'm going to pick you up and your family and take you to Africa. I th one day after months of this, I felt I said to God, God, if you want me to go to Africa, you better give me a desire to do it because there's nothing in me that wants to go to Africa. And it was before we got there, you couldn't have kept me off the plane. It was like God just so gave me a desire. It was, it was another one of the things, just a release in my desire, you know, to go. Don't be led by desires alone. But it is something that God can give. Suddenly you have a desire to do something you've never had before. Don't let that be the only thing that leads you. But it could be God saying, hey, pray into this thing. And either he's going to say no or he's going to say yes. But you need more than a desire. Seventh one we brought up here is intercession. Uh, it says in Romans 8, 26, 27, same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, do not know how we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit 
intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Somebody shared that one on prayer, and I, I found that's a major way that God speaks. You're just praying about something, the anointing on you, and he, every time you pray for that thing, you have such a burden. It's like you're bringing birth to something. It's one of the ways God can just say, heads up, I'm on that thing, you know, and, uh, and he speaks through that. My eighth one is circumstances. We, uh, as we shared here, we don't want circumstances to lead us, but obviously if God wants us to go somewhere, then he needs to open the door. Some things needed to fall into place for me to go to Africa. And uh, those circumstances came at the end, not at the front. Front end was God speaking over a year, and then all the circumstances came together in a few months. Uh, but they do need to come together. The door needs to open, you know. And uh, God's good at opening doors. In Revelations 3, 7, what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Don't allow circumstance to direct you. Circumstance follows. My ninth one is a fleece. Hey, you guys missed that one. How come? So many people are led by fleeces. Somebody said, you better sure, be sure it's the right fleece or you're going to get fleeced, you know. But uh, I just want to point out, it comes from Judges 6, of course, with Gideon. But uh, this is what I want to say about a fleece is, is it needs to be hard. <laughs> I mean, Gideon really made this thing hard. I mean, first he says, hey, if the, in the morning if there's moisture on the, uh, um, the fleece and there's no moisture on the ground, then, uh, then that will be a sign. He was using that as a fleece. Then he realized, well, that could happen, you know. A, a fleece doesn't attract moisture as much as uh, grass does. So he said, hey, forgive me, Lord, uh, I'm going to ask you again now. Can, let's, let's try again and make this thing harder. Uh, uh, water on, only on the fleece and not on the ground. Now that is really difficult to happen. And that's exactly what happened. But the thing is with, with uh, Gideon doing this thing is that what he was doing was an impossible thing. God was asking him to do something that was completely impossible. Now God already gave him some confirmations, nothing like an angel of the Lord sitting beside you, talking to you. <laughs> that would work. And then, you know, the fire falls from heaven and consumes the uh, offering that he's making. But he still is reticent about this thing. He wants to know that he knows. He doesn't know that God's about to drop his team of 30,000 soldiers down to 300. You know, he doesn't know that yet. But God knows that. So God is in this thing. He wants to encourage. He wants this, this guy. He's asking this guy to step out in faith with 300 men against what Scripture says in chapter 6, a host that could not be numbered. They covered the plains, it said, the Midianites, like locusts that could not be numbered. So he, he really needs to hear from God. This is a life and death kind of thing, you know. So to speak into fleeces, I believe God can use fleeces, but it, it needs to be something where God is really uh, being put to the test in this. I mean, make that fleece something that's difficult to happen, not, gee, I want to marry that girl. If she smiles at me, then she must be the girl for me. I mean, that's lame, you know. I mean, the chances of her smiling at you at some time in church is pretty good, you know. It's got to be a little more than that. My next one is the peace of God. I mentioned that one, Philippians 4, 6 says, it's a peace that transcends all understanding. There is this gift from God, this peace. And I think some of the things that God asks us to do are terrifying. Doesn't mean to say that you're not terrified, but there is a peace, an underlying peace. I'm sure we've all experienced that. There's some, something from heaven that just filled you with a peace and a confidence that this thing uh, is okay, you're all right. Well, God uses that peace. If that peace is lifting off of you, I found that if I want to make a purchase and Jackie doesn't have a peace about it, I really need to hear that. You know, Sometimes I just need to override that. I'm absolutely sure that that red pickup truck is for me. <laughs> She's not so convinced. Now, I've found over the years if Jackie doesn't have a peace, this is a girl who hears from God, so we try and make major decisions hearing together. And uh, if she has a check, even though I think it's you, this is a sale, what a deal. I mean, this is the couch we always needed. You've all been there. But um, God knows the best deals for you. Amen? It's worth waiting for him 
and uh, sticking in the peace of God together as a couple. My next one is angels. We uh, brought that one up, Matthew 1.24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. Uh, many, many people, again, are uneasy about angels, but uh, if you look through Scripture, there are 289 references to the interaction of angels with man uh, upon earth, right, from Genesis to Revelations. So uh, if you take uh, angels, for example, just out of the birth of Jesus into the world, you really don't have much of a story, you know. <laughs> Well, there's angels speaking to Joseph, angels speaking to Mary, angels speaking to Magi, uh, a number of times. Uh, I, uh, I don't think we can negate angels. It's not normal, and uh, some people seem to see angels. I, I'm not somebody who's ever seen an angel, or I, I have felt uh, an angel. I felt like it was an angel in uh, some different circumstances, but I, I don't see them. But I believe, scripturally, I have to believe that they can speak to us. It's just that we've got to watch it now because it's not something that's normal. It's very easy, like a lot of things, to get puffed up about this whole thing. Now I'm suddenly, we had this interaction with an angel and I'm going to write a book at it, uh, about it. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think all that sort of stuff is happening today, but I think it's dangerous. We should just expect it's another way. This is the God who wants to direct us. Why he uses different ways of doing it is because God wants to say to us, there's no formula to this thing. You can't push this button, that button, control, alt, delete, and God speaks, you know. Or the computer shuts down. I don't know what happens in control, alt, delete, but back in the DOS days, it did something. But, uh, but uh, uh, I think that's why God does it. God is God, and he loves this relationship with us. He keeps us in a place of being pressed into him. He wants to speak. We've got to be open. There are other factors involved in keeping us from hearing from God. But if we will be open, God will speak. But he will do it in different ways. He does speak. Another one I put in here is confirmation of the elders. Uh, Hebrews 13.7, I was sharing this morning that the elders keep watch over you as men who must give an account. I think out of that authority, uh, there's a covering uh, that comes with authority. Every area of authority has a covering that goes with it. And out of that calling and covering, if it's a major decision in my life, I, I don't encourage people to run to the elders every time you want to make a decision. Otherwise, we'd never get anything done. But if it's a major move, if it's a major decision of, of uh, ministry that you're called to, and you're in a church where these are elders are expecting to hear, they hear, uh, people, they're, they're pressed into a relationship with God, then I expect the elders to hear. I want to hear. I want to do this outside of, uh, out of the, uh, the authority of this church because there's a covering in that. I never want to get out of that. Uh, when we felt God was speaking to us so clearly about going to Africa before we said anything to anybody else, I said to Jackie, let's go to John, who was pastor of the church, and I was one of his elders, and there was about nine or ten of us, I think, at the time. I said, let's see if he'll take it to the elders, if he has any witness about it. And if he says no, and the elders say no, we're, we don't believe God's in this at all, then we're not going to Africa. They say, well, if God's calling you to go to Africa, <laughs> and you're really sure of it, and now you're trying to tell me that the elders would stop you going from Africa? Of course. Because these are guys, I'm on this eldership. These are guys that hear from God. We would meet together and pray every week and hear God together. So, uh, so the other side of it is true. If this really is God, they're going to hear, right? <laughs> and people are not so sure about that. A lot of people just make decisions. I don't know how many people have come to me with major decisions they wanted to make because I preach this. And we get together as elders and we pray about it and we're trying to hear from God and we really sense God saying no. Not now or not never. And uh, I've gone to many guys and said, I appreciate it. It's a great opportunity. They can pay you three times what you're making right now, but I don't believe you're supposed to go. We, we just cannot get a witness that you're supposed to go. Well, they storm out the door and they're going anyways. You know, how dare you keep me back from this oh, wonderful opportunity? I want to say, well, why did you ask me, you know? So you're going you're gonna to take a chance here. If you're going to go to the elders, then you've got to hear. Now, the other side of that is there have been many great men of God who have had everybody against them uh, on what God had called them to do. That's another side of it. At the end of the day, it's not the elders. The elders are responsible for you, but at the end of the day, the buck stops here with you. 
So I just want to put that kind of provision in this thing. But boy, I want to say this to you. If the elders really have a check on that thing, you better be sure that God is speaking to you to go. That's all I can say. Or you really are in for trouble. God is good. Keep smiling at me. Uh, well, that's an interesting story. I'm glad you asked that question because uh, John is, uh, was, an L, uh, was a uh, lawyer. Unlike uh, Terry, uh, who's bubbly and he's a very quiet, conservative, British kind of guy. Uh, never used to say all that much. Very determined about what he always chose his words very wisely. I, why he handed over to me, I'll never know because I'm the opposite. I'm a blabbermouth. But uh, so we, I said, well, then we're going to go, let's take it to John. So we went to his study and I uh, said, here's what God's saying to us. He got all excited because God had been speaking to him already about, I want you to step up missions. We'd always been a missions church. And God said, I want you to step up missions. So God was already at work in there, but he very wisely said, that doesn't mean to say that you're supposed to go. Um, let's take it to the elders and pray about it. He said, I'll, I'll pray about it, whether we should take it to the elders. I said, great, that's good. And I get in my car and go from his place to my place, which is probably about 25 minutes or so, 20 minutes. And as I come in the door, the phone's ringing. Now, this never happens with John. With John, if you asked him something like that, you probably hear days later or weeks later. Uh, that's what I was expecting. I thought it even months later, you know. But as I come in the door and phone's ringing, and I pick the phone up, it's him. He is pumped. Now, he never is never like that. <laughs> he was doing a terry on me. It was like a terry solicitor you know he was excited on the other he said wow when you guys went I prayed and God spoke to me you're supposed to go to Africa well let's get the elders together and pray about it and so we did and we just had word after word and it was really fun because we uh, it was actually over a year and a half that it took us to go and uh, to go to Africa I started exploring I'd never had thought of going as a missionary but I, I started exploring how you go to Africa, and evidently you can't just walk into every, any country and say, here I am, unless you got a job or something. Uh, you have to be sponsored by something. So there, there's these major missions organizations to go to Africa. So everybody said to me, oh, well, you've got to hook up with WEC or YOM or one of these groups, you know, to uh, have some covering in the country, or the, the government won't let you into the country. And I, thought, I guess I better do that. But that, that is where I was talking about check of the Holy Spirit. Every time I would go to do this, like God said, don't do that. I'm not going to take you the normal way. I've got a specific place I'm going to take to you in a completely different way than, than normal. So that was already pushing me out of my very <laughs> secure boat. And, uh, and uh, that's exactly what happened. Uh, when God said in seven months you're going to go, suddenly there was a, uh, yeah, it's a long story. I won't tell the whole story, but as God took us there. But it was over a period of time. That answered the question. Uh, if the elders had said to us, I really did mean it when I said that to Jackie. I can't believe if this is really God that they're not going to hear <laughs> from God. You know. My last one is to commit it to the Lord. And uh, I'd like to end with that one because I think that's where we live most of the time as I started what I was sharing. Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. So we don't go walking normally like this. You know, God God says five steps forward and two steps sideways. and He can send you out on a special commando raid and do that, you know, where he directs you, go down to Starbucks right now. And, and uh, that's fun to do those sort of things. But normally we just get on with it. I don't have to wake up in the morning and think, should I get out of bed, you know? <laughs> no, his alarm went off. It's time to get up. It's time to go to work, you know? Uh, should I brush my teeth? I mean, it's, it's, I'm not talking about that kind of hearing from God. Most of our uh, uh, life we live in, God's given us his word. We step out in faith. We expect him to direct us. And how many found he directs us many times without us even planning out? You didn't hear from God. Just suddenly you know this is a God encounter here. And he set it all up. Jackie and I were in Vancouver uh, recently and we had one of those God encounters. I, I love it where God sets things up. There's a very good friend of mine who's a Pentecostal pastor in Victoria. We're great friends. Uh, we kind of, in me handing the church over and him handing his church over, we had lost contact with each other. I didn't know he'd moved to Vancouver. So we're in Vancouver, ministered at a church over the weekend. It's Monday, our day off. We're going to take our time getting home. 
We're downtown. We wanted to go and have some tea. So all I wanted to do was go into a tea shop. Well, guess who's there? <laughs> There's four million people in Vancouver. The very tea shop that we go into, he's there. I mean, that, you know, this is God. You know. So I thought, oh, God, you really do love me. We just had a great time with this couple over tea. Well, it wasn't God directing it, but it was God directing, wasn't it? Uh, he did it, you know. So we've got to be open to the encounters of God also. God can set us up for things. You know, we either say, hey, I'm too busy. I've got my, my six things that have to happen before I get home from the store. You know, uh, We all live in these fast-paced world that we live in, and there's things we want to accomplish and get done. But in the midst of that, if we'll just keep our ears open to God, God will speak to us. And uh, it's fun. It's Definitely need to draw our kids into that. Your kids will get one serious, healthy dose of religion that will not make them go the distance if you don't direct them into a personal relationship with a living God and help them learn to hear from God. You know. Your kids are really young. Uh, we, used to, we trained our kids to have a quiet time right when they were young. And when it, uh, you could just say, hey, go have a quiet time. Mom and dad are praying. Why not do that and then bring them together and say, hey, what's God said to you this morning? It's very interesting what your kids will hear. You know? I mean, they don't know some of the decisions we're trying to make when they were young, and they'd come up with something. I think, where did that come from? That came from heaven. You know? <laughs> Here's another way God speaks to you, through little voices, little kids. But you want to train them up into that? And uh, that's all I've got to say. Has anybody else got something to say? Maybe you want to add to that? Terry? You're from good. Is it legally sound and correct? I'm not going to get in trouble. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm going to break you into little groups here. What I'd like to do is break us into groups of four, three, four. You don't want it too big. But um, this is a workshop. So we've been talking about hearing from God. Why not break into a group of three or four? I like the idea of three or four rather than two, because when it's two, you feel like, I've got to say something to them. They said something to me. Whereas I find in a little group, you can kind of work off of other people. It gives me time to think for a while about what I'm seeing or hearing. But uh, you don't want it too big, but put somebody in the middle. We just spread around here. Can we do that? Three or four, and then just take uh, a few minutes and pray for one another, and let's hear. You'll be very surprised some of the things that God will speak to you. If you see a little picture... Why not step out and say, hey, I don't know, this, I see pineapple, you know, what does that mean, you know? <laughs> when I look at you, I see pineapples, you know? <laughs> well, see, that's funny, we're just praying about whether we should go to, you know, Mexico or something. Could be a confirmation. I'm just giving you an example. But uh, let's not take it as, boy, we've got to run out the door and go do what somebody says to us today, but let's keep open to God. God, God sees us. Uh, by faith. He sees us in ways that we don't see ourselves with the natural. And uh, why not speak those things over one another? And uh, maybe there's some decision people are making and your little word could just encourage them in that decision. Yep, for that? Let me pray for you. Why don't you stand up so you look like you're ready to move, you know? Lord, we just thank you. You're an awesome God. You're wondrous. We praise you. You are the God of speak. And uh, you brought us into this amazing relationship with you. Every relationship's based on good communication. So we want to get better at hearing, Lord. We ask you to forgive us for just going and doing our own thing. Uh, we want to be more open to hearing from you and the whispers of heaven, a still, small voice, in whatever way it comes, whether it's through somebody else or in our own spirit. Uh, let us respond to those things, even now as we break into groups, Lord. Uh, I just think that you can speak uh, in ways that people are not used to hearing. Or maybe not. But uh, we want to give you the opportunity, Lord. Thank you, Father. Everybody said amen.